In hindsight, it feels like my childhood flew by pretty fast. 1989 through 2008 went by like a fucking blur, and yet so much happened back then. From the age of four, when my grandma first gave me a Nintendo Entertainment System, video games have become a part of who I am. What I didn't know was during the same year I was just starting to become a gamer, a video game released overseas that wouldn't get its true moment to shine until 28 years later. Live Alive from Square, now Square Enix, would release originally in 1994 to a lukewarm reception financially in Japan that would steadily grow into a cult following globally over the next three decades. Unless you had grown up in Japan or were very deep in the emulation scene, it was very likely you had never heard of Live Alive until the remake was announced earlier this year in February. From that first announcement, I knew there was something special on our hands. An old school turn-based RPG spread across time and space from the perspective of multiple different characters with very different stories and playstyles that would somehow, some way, converge to face a greater evil. I was sold on the concept. I knew I had to play it. In a year that has had games like Elden Ring and God of War Ragnarok, Live Alive was actually my most anticipated game of the year. This review will likely read like several mini-reviews as I talk about the different eras of the game, so grab your history books, open your wiki pages, because we're going on a journey through time that only video games can offer. This is Live Alive. Portrayed as a coming-of-age story, the prehistory section of Live Alive puts us in the shoes, or more appropriately, bare feet, of a cave boy who I appropriately named Unga Bunga Mundo and his best friend, an ape named Gori. Sent out to hunt animals for his tribe, players are introduced to the basic combat of Live Alive, as well as Unga's unique ability to catch sense of monster encounters and hidden items on the wind and properly track them down. Unga's moveset is fairly balanced between melee and range attacks, as are Gori's, though the abilities are just different enough to complement each other and make most encounters a breeze. Unga's story will quickly escalate to a tale between conflict between tribes, human sacrifice, and meeting a girl for the very first time. This entire first chapter is completely done without words, instead conveying emotions and stuff through grunts and image bubbles to demonstrate what the characters are quote-unquote saying to each other. Regardless of what chapter you pick afterwards, I firmly believe that the prehistory chapter is absolutely where your experience with Live Alive should begin. After the prehistoric era, I decided to try to move in a chronological order through the ages. Selecting the Imperial China era, players are put in the role of an elderly Shifu who feels that his life is in its waning years. With the sun setting on this old man, he takes it upon himself to find disciples that he may pass on his knowledge, wisdom, and fighting techniques to a new generation. In this chapter, your character actually starts at level 10, and instead of leveling up the Shifu, you are using him to recruit and level up three potential disciples, a cocky female bandit in the woods, a larger-than-life man whose appetite and lack of job drives him to th petty theft, and a young boy driven to a life of organized crime to provide for his grandmother. This is one of the most prominent examples of choices mattering in the overall context of the plot of Live Alive, because whichever student you nurture the most will ultimately be the one chosen by the Shifu to pass his torch onto. This chapter of the game is very combat heavy and really gets to show off the variety of characters and lets players experiment with what moves are hot and which are not for each encounter. This is where one of the few negative things I can say about the game rears its head though. Because so much of the combat happening is in the later half of the chapter, the battle music for this era plays nearly constantly, and while it's enjoyable enough in small doses, if you hear it on a loop long enough, it can push you towards insanity and an absolute migraine. Moving on to the Twilight of Edo, Japan, players take on the role of a shinobi sent to a sprawling castle to rescue a prisoner and defeat a tyrannical warlord who has his eyes set on ruling all of Japan. 
This chapter encourages players to try to play without killing any human enemies, with some basic stealth mechanics and a variety of different pathways to traverse to complete your mission. If you try to go the stealth route, there is a very convenient area where you can grind your level up on paranormal enemies, and the leveling process is quick enough that you won't feel like you're spending too much time here. And I highly encourage players to do this if they're taking the stealth route, because that will really help at the boss battle at the end of the, end of the chapter. I also encourage players to take the stealth route because it, it's just really satisfying and a unique way to play a stealth segment in this game. It kind of reminded me of the earliest days of Metal Gear back on MSX, with a few extra bells and whistles worth noting. If you're able to complete the entire chapter without killing human enemies, you'll even land a unique item that will help towards the end of the game. It's not necessary, but it is cool to be rewarded for restraining yourself. One last note. This is also the most obvious showing of a real person in Live Alive, and the only one that is explicitly stated, which is pretty cool if you ask me. Ah, the Old West, the chapter I was personally looking forward to the most when the game was first announced earlier this year. My European friends have jokingly called me Cowboy over the years due to my recreational gun use, my love of camping, and my wanderlust that presents itself whenever I watch a classic Old Western movie, and I suppose they're not wrong. Some of my favorite games over my decades gaming have indeed been cowboy games, which feel few and far between as time presses on. The Old West era of Live Alive puts players in the shoes of an outlaw on the run with a price on his head, with a persistent bounty hunter hot on his trail. Their fates collide with a town being constantly oppressed by a gang of raiders led by a ruthless Civil War officer. Putting their rivalry aside, the outlaw and bounty hunter rally the townspeople to make a stand by preparing the town with traps. There's only a handful of combat moments in this chapter, with most of the chapter actually gathering items and setting up traps in a time limit to catch the gang off guard. If you do it successfully, the final moments of this chapter will see all but the gang leader wiped out, and then you face him down. Your choices here matter a lot, because one mistake can make the final boss encounter much harder. I absolutely loved how this basically played out like a spaghetti western, and the self-awareness to reference real-world people, as well as several nods to actors and characters they portrayed in cowboy flicks, was much appreciated. The present day era is the shortest chapter of the game, and it plays out in a way that is very tongue-in-cheek references to the various fighting games of the 80s and 90s, right down to the music. As an aspiring martial artist seeking to become the best fighter the world has ever seen, you select your opponents from a menu screen and trot around the globe to face them down. By fighting them and observing their movements, you can learn their unique movesets and subsequently use their abilities against them and other opponents. Short but sweet, I really enjoyed this chapter overall, but I would have enjoyed it even more if we got to see more of the different locales we got to fight in. There's also a very peculiar thing that they've done with this remake, where the opponent Max Morgan, who looks exactly like Hulk Hogan as far as the character sprite goes, has had the actual character art changed in the chat box to remove the iconic handlebar mustache. This isn't really a pro or con, it's just kind of odd to me. It's like they were worried that Hulk Hogan was going to try to sue or something, and... You know, maybe, I don't know, I don't I don't know Hulk Hogan, maybe he would sue over that, but maybe it's just now becoming an issue because the game is being re-released stateside. I don't know. The near future era is easily the low point of Live Alive for me, and even then I still had a lot of fun with it. And what can best be described as a bunch of anime tropes thrown together, this chapter has everything from a randomly powered super protagonist to mech battles. It drags on just a little too long for a payoff that's pretty underwhelming, but the protagonist of this chapter becomes very useful in the endgame, so I can't knock it too hard. Despite being one of the longer chapters in the game, I actually had the least to say about it. It's fun, but it's a mess, and it ultimately feels like there were just a lot of extra ideas here that were kind of shoved in that may not have been necessary. Have you ever played Alien Isolation? The Distant Future chapter reminds me a lot of portions of that game, but presented in a retro styling. Set aboard a spaceship, players take on the role of a helpful little robot that is caught in the middle of a situation that involves the crew turning on each other, an alien life form, and something far more sinister lurking behind the scenes. There's only one moment of combat in this chapter, and it is the final boss fight. But prior to that, there's a lot of running away from a massive alien that will kill you instantly if it captures you. 
The story here is really rich and engrossing and shows that you don't have to be flesh and bone to show traits of humanity. When things look bleakest, heroism truly shines through, friendships are formed, and one little robot does what his peers fail to do. And congratulations, you beat Live Live. I'm actually kidding, though. After all that, you'd think I'd covered all the ins and outs about the entire game, right? You, but no. The final two chapters of the game encompass basically what can best be described as the entire second half of Live Alive, where worlds collide as paths converge against a common evil. I'm purposely avoiding any major details here, because they really have to be experienced firsthand to just really understand how special Live Alive is as a game. You know there's that meme about gamers where we don't have a life, but we live several? Live Alive sort of embodies that in a fun way that can be enjoyed by gamers young and old, and makes it something very special in my opinion, and an absolute must play. This blast from the past brought into the future has more than earned its place in the present as one of the nominees fighting for Jerwinko Gaming's 2022 Game of the Year. And that wraps it up for this video. Thank you for tuning in to hear my thoughts on this game. If you're a returning subscriber, I'm glad to see you back. If you're a new viewer, please consider subscribing to the channel. Every subscription, like, dislike, and comment helps within the algorithm, so please do what you can to help elevate small content creators like myself if you like what we have to offer in this hobby we know and love as video games. There's also a Patreon link down below if you'd like to donate. This has been another Jawinko Gaming installment, and I will see you all next time.